are a family here in Columbia, and we have, um, since the Story Slam last year, I have watched some babies bloom. Like, I had, there were, like, Story Slam babies that happened, and one of whom... The originators are in this room, and I love this group of people. They are putting on a free story slam called the Screen Door Story Slam, and I, I love them. I stalk them a little too much. I, can, I know that they're having another one in August, and it's at the library. And you can look them up on Facebook, too, but guess what? I did. I went and begged. I'm like, please, Allison, co-creator of Screen Door Story Slam, I, I don't want you to help me with this one. Maybe I need some help. I want you to come and tell a story. And she's here tonight. Let's bring the lights down and bring Allison up to the stage. Allison. Hi. I'm very grateful to Rachel who took this off the mic stand because I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, can you hear me? All right. The tigers have found me and I do not care. We love to use all kinds of flowery language to talk about grief, right? Um, we start off by saying, you know, grief and death are so big, so great, so vast, so unimaginable that we shouldn't even try to put them into words. But being humans, we like to try even when we shouldn't. So, we say things like, grief is like an ocean, it's unpredictable, and it's vast, or it is a lonely walk, and you don't really know where you're going, or it's a labyrinth, and you're trying to find your way out. And I saw this one illustrator posted something on Instagram, of course, because that's where art happens now, um, and it was a drawing of grief in this giant burlap sack, like a trash bag full of grief. And then it was a briefcase, and then it was a purse. And so the idea is that grief never goes away, but it's a shapeshifter. And hopefully over time it gets easier to carry. So um, my story is about Jared. And Jared and I dated three different times, and the last time was pretty short. It was only for about a month, and it was leading right up until he died by suicide. And, um, you know, I hadn't really told many of my friends that we were seeing each other again because the other two times that we had been together were so difficult. And so understandably, my friends would have been concerned about me to be back in that relationship, but... So I hadn't really told anybody yet, and so when he did die, there was this double layer of like, I'm nervous to tell my friends that I had been seeing him again, and I'm also scared to drop this thing that he's, he's died now. And the thing is, I broke up with him, and he died that night. I broke up with him, and he was gone an hour later. He had shot himself. And so how do you fashion an approachable truth out of that to present to your loved ones, the people that care about you, without scaring them <laughs> and without scaring yourself too? And so immediately following Jared's death, my grief was like a car. I wish it had been a burlap sack or a trash bag, but it was a freaking car like a Hummer situation um, but like a Hummer that was being driven maybe by an FBI agent and they were undercover so they were being sneaky they were trying to pretend like they weren't trailing me and I was trying to ignore them too I was like oh psh, don't worry about that back there that's not grief no big deal don't need to deal with it and so in this state of shock and just complete and self-awareness, I said things in some ways that made people uncomfortable. Cautionary tale, if your boyfriend dies and you immediately start referring to him as my dead boyfriend, people will raise their eyebrows and look at you with a lot of concern. <laughs> so, if any of you, you know, want to give me some therapist recommendations after this, if you're up here thinking, dang, this girl needs to talk about it somewhere else, 
please bring them on. I'm ready. Um, and so, understandably, I was not dealing with it the best. I uh, remember that I uh, had left work early one day to go help his parents. It was a couple days after he had died and his parents were down um, cleaning out his apartment and moving his stuff out because he was from Connecticut. And so I was at my car leaving early and my boss saw me and she said, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm going to help clean out my dead boyfriend's apartment. This didn't go over very well, of course. <laughs> so over time, I have tried to take my morbidly direct manner <laughs> and shift it around into something that's a little bit more palatable for public consumption. So now I say things like, I lost somebody that I loved, or um, I had a boyfriend who died. And these days, uh, most of the time, I like to include that he died by suicide because that's important to put out there and destigmatize for anybody else who might be dealing with it. So I say, you know, oh, I had a boyfriend who died by suicide. And that seems to be both truthful enough <laughs> and less offensive and less scary. <laughs> and so just by shifting that language around, um, I have kind of invited that car a little bit closer and said, all right, I see you. I'm ready to deal with you a little bit. Maybe, I'm, maybe I've gotten in the car, I hope, <laughs> riding in the grief now. Um, or maybe someday, you know, it'll turn into like a suitcase with wheels. That'd be rad. <laughs> um, and so Jared, uh, he was a poet, and he had five tattoos, and two of the tattoos were bits of his favorite poetry. So he had this half sleeve on his left bicep that was a giant blue jay, and there was a tiger's face in the eye of the blue jay, and no, we're not going into an eye of the tiger situation. I know you were worried. <laughs> there was a quote um, from a Charles Bukowski poem around the Blue Jay that said, the tigers have found me and I do not care. And when he got this, Jared talked to me about the quote and what that meant to him. And to him, it sort of meant that you were in this place where all of your fears had caught up to you, your mental illness had bested you, all of your secrets had come out, and you just didn't care anymore. You were weightless, you were beyond it, kind of invulnerable. And he had this tattoo for about two years before he died, and closer to the time that he did die, he would say things to me like, you know, Allison, I got this line tattooed on my body that says that I don't care, but now that the tigers have actually found me, I think I was wrong. I do care. I was wrong. And so what do you, what do, you do with something like that? <laughs> I, why didn't I listen a little bit more closely? Um, it's really tempting when a tragedy happens or something terrible happens that everything that happened before that takes on this new lens, this new gloss of meaning and perception and you attribute cause to everything. And so when I'm going, sifting back through these memories of Jared, it's really hard for me to not take each and every moment and think that I should have known what was coming and what was gonna happen and not to kick myself for my lack of action. But of course, it's a little of both, you know? When something good happens, is it because you caused it and that everything leading up to it, everything, every decision that you made made that happen? No, you know, it's a game of chance in a lot of ways. When someone dies, they don't lose their complexity. I think that there's this temptation when someone has passed to um, view them through rose-colored glasses. <laughs> you get kind of the fluffy obituary about what a pure and beautiful person that they are. And that's great, that is useful. That is what we need to memorialize people in that way. But because of that, it's become, it's been difficult for me to talk about my relationship with Jared and talk about who he was honestly in the wake of his suicide because who wants to hear the gritty parts of a messy and problematic relationship when somebody is no longer around? You know, you don't want to talk about that. You don't want to talk about the fights that you had and the things about them that just drove you absolutely insane and how they could be so stubborn and how the first time that they met your friends, they ordered tea when you were at the bar and everybody else was drinking 
And now you think that's cute, but at the time you were like, what are you doing? <laughs> Drinking hot tea. Um, but you don't want to talk about that stuff. People want to hear the good moments and, and the sweet memories. And I have, I have plenty of those. I have so many. But you can't erase the rest of it because that would be an erasure of the whole person. And that would be a disservice to them. And Jared was messy, <laughs> very messy. And so I try to keep that. Um, so a little bit of the poem by Bukowski, it's called For Jane. And it goes, when you left, you took almost everything. I kneel at nights in front of tigers that will not let me be. What you were will not happen again. The tigers have found me, and I do not care. He had a, just a perfect encapsulation of grief tattooed on his body, and I didn't even know to look up the poem and read the rest of it until after he was gone and had taken that tattoo with him. Um, but now I find it a great source of comfort, and some people say that grief is like a hole in their stomach that never goes away, but for me, my grief is a soft weight on my shoulders where he used to rub them while I was doing dishes, or a tingling in my right hand during Shavasana at the end of yoga practice where his left hand used to be next to mine, or the memory of worrying over and loving self-injury scars on his forearms that were covered by these beautiful hawk feather tattoos, or um, a warm, sleepy cocoon, the best nap, <laughs> where I felt completely safe. And he was awake. <laughs> he just held me and watched me. And when I, when I woke up and smiled at him, ever the poet, he said, you smiled at me like you had the sun in your mouth. And so maybe my grief doesn't have to be a car. Maybe it can be a tiger. It can be my grief, my tiger, my fierce guardian, my challenger, my warrior spirit. It can be my wild heart and my devotion. My grief, my tiger is my love. Thank you. <laughs>